Oh no, come on. Hi everyone, welcome to another Talk Math with your friends. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Meredith Sargent. She is a postdoc at the University of Arkansas. She's an analyst who studies functional analysis and operator theory. And she is on the job market looking for either tenure track or postdoc positions. So if you have any leads or, or guidance, uh, please feel free to hit her up. And she is also, I wanna say an organizer for another Zoom uh, colloquium, Otter, a operator theory talk for early researchers. And so we'll be dropping some links in the chat as we go. So everyone, please join me in uh, welcoming Meredith. Okay, hi everybody. Um, so we're gonna talk about functional analysis today and we're going to do it through the lens of one of my recent research topics. We're gonna to talk about optimal approximants and orthogonal polynomials. Now in my abstract and the way I've been advertising this, I've been telling you that functional analysis is secretly just linear algebra. <laughs> So we are going to start this talk the same way every introductory linear algebra class begins by saying, this is a vector. <laughs> it has a magnitude and a direction. When I was first learning um, linear algebra, I was taking at the same time as my Calc 3 class and my intro physics class. All of those lectures were on the same day, one right after another. So I got, this is a vector. It has a magnitude and a direction three times in a row. But then fortunately for me, later, I took my second linear algebra class. And this linear algebra class um, turned me into a bit of a conspiracy theorist. Oh, my slides aren't changing. Are my slides changing for you guys? Mm -hmm. hmm. Let me see if I can. There we go turn me into a bit of a conspiracy theorist. So when I say this, I mean, um, we were talking about things in terms of vectors. And in your first linear algebra class, you maybe see like the polynomial spaces, but especially if you compare that to say Calc 3, you're pretty much always living in Rn, which is lovely, Rn is fine. But I was finally in my second linear algebra class realized, oh my gosh, it's all connected. I can do vector spaces of functions and then like what if I think about convergence here what does that even mean and I just was like guys guys it's all the same and everyone looked at me like a crazy person so um I'm hoping I can infect all of you with this so you can all be crazy people with me so all right let's actually talk some linear algebra here then Finite dimensional vector spaces over R or C, they're all secretly just Rn or Cn. This is not so hard to see, right? You choose a basis, <clears throat> then you write the elements of that vector space in terms of the basis. And then you can just take those coefficients and plop them into a vector and then, well, it's secretly Rn or Cn depending what you allowed your coefficients to be. Okay, an example, one of my favorite examples. The polynomial spaces. We're talking about Pn. This is a set of polynomials of degree n or less. Um, this is why um, I, you may have noticed, I'm starting all of my numbering for my basis and everything. I'm starting it all at zero. This is why. Because I want to be able to talk about my basis vectors. I'd really like to be able to use them as monomials. So um, with my set of polynomials here, you can see an easy basis to choose for this is just the set of monomials. Awesome. And you can see this is just um, isomorphic to R n plus one. All right, so another thing in Rn and Cn, we like to talk about the lengths of the vectors and the angles between them. So we talk about the dot product and the norm. So our dot product, I'm just going to talk about for now, our classic Euclidean dot product, you just multiply across entries and add them up. And then the magnitude will then be the square root of a vector dotted with itself. Remember the dot product, this is how you can talk about whether two vectors are perpendicular or you can talk about um, the angle between them if you do the cosine thing. So, but what about our polynomial spaces? I mean, yeah, they're isomorphic to Rn or Cn. But like, it'd be really nice 
if we had a dot product that knew that they were functions. Because currently, our Euclidean dot product, this is lovely, you can kind of talk about the angle between things, I guess. But <laughs> if it's the same for Rn as it is for the set of polynomials, then those polynomials, why are we even bothering thinking about them that way? So instead of using the Euclidean dot product, we're going to generalize to an inner product. So an inner product, you can define lots of them. It's something that has similar properties to the dot product. It should be conjugate symmetric. So in this case, I'm going to say um, we're going to be dealing with things over the complex numbers. So this means if you flip them, you add a bar to the top. Should be linear in the first argument. So you can pull out constants and you can um, split things up along plus and minus. Should be positive semi-definite. If you dot product something with itself, you shouldn't get a negative number. And point separating. So in this case, the only way you can get zero is if you started out with zero. And then similarly, we define the norm. We say, all right, u is just going, the norm of u is just going to be the square root of this inner product with itself. And when you've got a norm, you can do some cool things. You can get your Cauchy-Schwarz inequality saying, all right, inner product of uv, that should be less than or equal to norm of u times norm of v. Everybody loves Cauchy-Schwarz. And then triangle inequality, that's important too, right? For it to be a norm. So you wanna be able to have your Cauchy-Schwarz and your triangle inequality. And then the other big thing you usually see when you see norms is the Pythagorean theorem. And this comes back to how inner products, just like the dot product, we can talk about things being orthogonal. So when I teach Calc 3, I always make a pest of myself by not letting the students call the vectors perpendicular. Because they really want to. Because like, yeah, I mean, they are perpendicular. But I don't want them saying perpendicular because I want us to be prepared for when we talk about more general things. Orthogonality, like, what does it mean to say two polynomials are perpendicular? You know, that's silly, right? Mm -hmm. They're polynomials, they're functions. So instead, we're going to say, all right, they're orthogonal if their dot product is zero or their inner product is zero. And if you get that, then you get this lovely Pythagorean theorem that we all know and love. All right, inner product space. You just get yourself a set of vectors, you endow it with an inner product and the associated norm, and it's great. You can talk about angles between things. Big scare quotes. All right, so let's go back to our polynomial spaces. These are our example that is going to be in our hearts this whole time. Under the Euclidean inner product, so just the dot product where these things were um, isomorphic to Rn or Cn, the monomials form an orthonormal basis. They're all mutually orthogonal and they've all got norm one. Cool, you can check this yourself, put out some paper, write it down by writing monomials as vectors in Rn. You'll get your standard basis vectors, one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 zero. Clearly these are going to be norm one. But again, we really want an inner product that knows that they're functions, right? The Euclidean dot product doesn't know they're functions. It just says, oh, they're vectors, just like our vectors in Rn. So instead we say, all right, let's have this inner product be something that involves integration, something that knows these are functions. And we're going to consider just integration on 0, 1. The interval 0, 1, I'll multiply them together. I've currently defined this so everything is real. So I'll just do f times g, integrate that on 0, 1. Sweet. Now, in this case, the monomials are no longer orthogonal, not under this inner product. But we could use Gram-Schmidt on the set of monomials to find a set of orthogonal polynomials. So here's some. I did the first few for you. Um, they're not as pretty as we might hope, right? There's all these weird constants. And I didn't normalize these. I just got orthogonal polynomials, not orthonormal ones, which is like distressing in its own way, right? Because if you wanted to normalize them, you'd have to divide by some awful constant, and you would be very sad. But we could continue doing this to find as many orthogonal polynomials as we wanted. No matter how big your polynomial space is, you can find a nice orthogonal basis for it. Sweet. Now, I said no matter how big it is, what if we just say all of the polynomials? And since they're polynomials, they've only got finitely many non-zero coefficients, right? 
you're not going to have some infinite thing. You don't have to think about convergence. It's just polynomials. And here, use the same norm. It totally works. You can build your orthogonal polynomials just like I said. No big deal. This is an example of an infinite dimensional vector space because you can have whatever highest power you want, right? And each one, you're going to need a new basis vector for it. Another kind of canonical example of, of an infinite dimensional vector space is the square summable complex sequences with the Euclidean inner product, L2. Sometimes you'll hear this called Hilbert space. So what I'm saying here is you get a sequence. You want everything to be square summable. This is just exactly our dot product, right? Except now we're allowing it to go to infinity. OK, now this is great. I've got polynomials, and I've got these infinite sequences. But I want to do functional analysis, right? So what I'm going to do is combine them, right? I'm going to say, all right, this is a big, long definition, but we're going to get through it. I want to have analytic function. So analytic means it's got this nice power series. Um, alternatively, it means it's infinitely differentiable. But all you care about is that it's got this nice power series that converges. And I'm going to live in the complex world, because then we can talk about the complex unit disk. And it's really nice. So we know that analytic lots of derivatives, it's all good. So then we're going to require the coefficients to be square summable, just like with our square summable complex sequences. And we'll define an inner product just like a dot product, except now I'm being careful about my um, conjugates. Then we define my favorite function space, the Hardy space, as the set of all of these functions that are analytic on D with square summable coefficients. So this is the first new big exciting thing we're talking about. How are we all doing? Questions? <clears throat> okay. So I don't remember how much of a restriction that analytic on D is once you know that square summable, um, but it seems reasonable. Yeah, yeah. Um, we usually are careful to define it anyway. Part of this comes down to, well, here's our Hardy space again. Let's talk about some of the nice properties it's got. Um, we're using the Euclidean inner product, so monomials are orthogonal. We can get away with this because we live in the complex world. Our monomials are z to the n. And secretly what we're doing, um, so each polynomial subspace, that's a subspace. Cool. But the really exciting part about this is through some math by um, Fatou and Poisson, the, you can think of this function that's analytic on the disk with these square summable coefficients. You can think about that as the same function except on the unit circle. And this is nice because since we're on the complex disk and we're talking about, think about it as integration, think about it as a function on the unit circle, well, this inner product actually lines up with an integration inner product. And this is how it agrees that these monomials are orthogonal, both in the obvious sense because it's like the Euclidean inner product, but also in the sense that when you integrate e to the i theta to the n, around the circle, you'll get nice orthogonal things. So the Hardy space is great. It is the nice functions we want to talk about here. However, one of our favorite functions is not in the Hardy space. It's analytic on the open disk. This is kind of what you were saying, Brian, analytic on the open disk, but not, not in the Hardy space. This is a great function. Right? Like, this is one of our favorite functions. It's the first one you learn about in Calc 2, right? When you're doing power series, because it's just a geometric series. It's a wonderful function. But if you add up 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared, you're certainly not going to get something finite. So it's not in the Hardy space. But, like, maybe we can approximate it by things that are in the Hardy space. It's this function that's good, but it's not in, like, it's not nice. It's not in our Hardy space. Maybe we can fake it. Now, one thing we could do is just do this Calc 2 style. Partial, partial sums of the Taylor series. Rad. This gives a decent pointwise approximation. It's pretty nice. 
But didn't I just say that this whole thing is linear algebra? What does it mean for an approximation to be good in linear algebra? Well, for something to be close in linear algebra, so approximating something, I want a good approximation means they're close in some sense. In Calc 2, we thought of close in terms of a pointwise approximation. But in linear algebra, two vectors are like close together when they're close in norm. When you say, all right, PN, I'm going to choose, like, let's do this with polynomials. They're better. So some polynomial minus F, I'd like that norm to be small. But we've got an issue. Our function f here, 1 over 1 minus b, that's not in the Hardy space. So we can't actually take this norm. No matter what polynomial you use, and then you subtract f off, this thing's still not going to have square summable coefficients because polynomials, well, you're not going to be able to get rid of every single of the infinite number of ones. So you can't actually take this norm. So what we're going to do instead is say, all right, Let's just divide everything by f, and we'll have pn times little f minus 1. We want that norm to be small, where little f here is 1 minus z. So we're thinking about saying, all right, instead of really looking at 1 over 1 minus z, we're going to use just 1 minus z. We're just going to use the denominator there. OK. Now, important stuff, pn. This is polynomial subspace of the Hardy space. F times Pn is also a subspace of the Hardy space. This requires proof. Um, this is actually true for any F that is in the Hardy space. Let's think about why this is true. This, this is the exercise that I have here. If you write down the integral definition of the H2 norm, remember that's your integral of modulus f squared around the circle. If you multiply that by some bounded analytic function, like a polynomial, polynomials are bounded on nice compact things, you will still have the integral of some bounded thing times your f squared, and that bounded thing, it's not going to change the boundedness of it. You're integrating over a compact space, you are integrating a bounded function, it's fine. Um, side note, this is the idea behind what's called the multiplier algebra. Some functions you can multiply in. In this case, all bounded functions work. So f times this polynomial space, this will also be a subspace of h2. Now, what, what do we want? We want the polynomial pn star that minimizes this norm, pn f minus 1. So in my abstract, I said we want functions, we want to approximate functions that are not nice by functions that are nice, and we want the best approximation. This is what I mean by the best approximation. I want to minimize this norm. So subspace time. Um, this would be a time to drop a link. I have made us a GeoGebra in three dimensions thing for us to play with a little bit. Let's see if I can pull it up. Can you all see my screen? You should be able to click on it and look at yours too. So on here, I have a lovely subspace. It's a plane. And I have a vector, A, or I guess it's U, to point to a point A that's not in the plane. And then I have a vector in the plane, that B there, that I want to say, all right, how close are these two vectors together? So I can look at the difference between them. That's that vector W. And you should be able to do this too. You can slide around your vector b here using these two sliders. And it will always stay in the plane, but you can change the distance and where it's at. And it's a nice thing you can rotate this around a little bit too. Um, I use GeoGebra 3D graphing a ton. Um, I'm a huge proponent of it because I cannot draw to save my life. So we use this a lot in Calc 3. So yeah, I can move this thing around. And I would really like to be able to get it like so that W is really short. So let's try rotating it a little bit more, see what I can do. Yeah, I think I want to go this way. That's well, just making it longer. That's not good. You can continue rotating it around yourself if you want. 
But what I'm going to do now is instead of looking at B here, I'm just going to tell you what the answer is. We want to look at the projection. So I'm going to turn off B so this thing doesn't get too crowded. Uh, I don't need to do this one either. OK. Oh, and this one too. There's a W. All right. So this is the thing we actually want. We want the orthogonal projection. You look at that, it's right angle, right? We want the orthogonal projection of our vector that's not in our subspace onto our subspace. That's going to be what makes that distance the shortest. Mm -hmm. And we're going to want to look at this thing right here, this little green vector. OK, <coughs> so let's go back to this. We're saying we want a thing in the subspace, the subspace being f times pn. That's my pn f. I want it to be so it's the closest to, well, it looks like 1 here. I'm saying I'm trying to minimize the norm pnf minus 1. So what I'm doing for my optimal polynomial approximants, I'm saying I want to find the polynomial such that this pnf is equal to the orthogonal projection onto that subspace of 1. That'll minimize the norm, because that's what orthogonal projections do. They minimize the norm. If we go back to our picture here, my a vector like this is like the vector 1. That green vector, the projection, that's our pn star times f. And this perp right here, this is pnf minus 1, or 1 minus pnf. I might have the directions backwards. OK. So we can define an optimal polynomial approximate. This orthogonal projection, rad. OK, cool. But how do we find it, right? We want to actually be able to find what this thing is instead of just saying, oh, well, it's the projection. Sweet, that's fun, I guess. So we say, all right, let's remember our picture. Go back to it. I want to find that green vector. And if you look at this, let's see, from here, you can see the green vector plus the black vector is going to give us the blue vector. You've got your parallel component and your perpendicular component. So the perpendicular component is this pn star f minus 1. That should be orthogonal to everything in the plane. That's literally what it means to be the perpendicular component. Mm -hmm. And well, being orthogonal to everything in the plane, that's enough to be orthogonal just to all the basis vectors. And our basis vectors in this case, well, it's going to be the monomials times f. Might not be an orthogonal basis, but it's the basis vectors. So what does that mean? It means, all right, pn f minus 1 inner product with z to the ks, that should be equal to 0. That's orthogonality. Rewrite it. Split things up. We've got linearity of the inner product, so scrooge that over to the other side. And notice that the right-hand side of this equation has no pn in it at all, right? Once you know f, you know, to, you know exactly what that is for every single k. And we know that pn is a polynomial. Let's say it's this polynomial. It's got coefficient cj. OK, so plug it in. pnf inner product zkf. This should be this polynomial times f inner product zkf. And again, we're going to use linearity to split things up. All right, did that. Sweet. So we end up with using the fact that pnf zkf should be equal to 1 inner product zkf. We know that this stuff here, can you guys see my mouse? I don't know if you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, we can. Awesome. So this stuff here should be equal to our 1 zkf. And I'm claiming here that this is equal to um, conjugate of f of 0 if k is equal to 0 and 0 otherwise. Um, Think to yourself about why this might be true. It's a little weird to see. Um, it might be helpful to think about writing out um, zkf as a vector. Alternatively, I've done it for you. So here, 
um, it's making my handwriting look a lot worse than it actually is, but there's f of z here. It's some analytic function. In fact, we know what it is for us, right? It's one minus z, but in general, it's some analytic function. We multiply it by zk, we get z to the j plus k, then we take our inner product, sweet. One, zkf, well, that'll be a j bar, because remember, it's in the second component here. So when it comes out, it gets bar on it. One, z j plus k, and we know that monomials are orthogonal. So this is only non-zero when k is equal to zero. Otherwise, you're gonna have one and z to some power and that's no good. Okay, so hopefully you believe me that that should be equal to f of zero bar if k is equal to zero and zero otherwise. So this bad boy is just a system of equations. I get a different equation for every k and then I have all of these cj's. Well, let's put the cj's together into a vector. Let's call it c for coefficients. And then we'll have all of these little norms, all of these inner products here. This is what's called a Gramian, because I'm doing z to the j and z to the k. And that should be equal to this big old vector, where it's equal to f of zero bar if k is equal to zero and zero otherwise. This is just a system of equations. And because we're dealing with a polynomial, this really is a nice finite matrix. You can just row reduce and solve this if you want, or better yet, you can make a computer row reduce and solve it. <laughs> so nice. We can find the coefficients of the optimal polynomials for whatever optimal polynomial we want, right? I just have to solve a different system. Compute the matrix, solve the system. Sweet. Okay. Now, the other thing in my talk is talking about orthogonal polynomials. So if we think about how orthogonal polynomials are going to be related to our optimal approximants, let's go back to our GeoGebra plane. In our plane here, it's a subspace, right? You can find a basis for your subspace. Plane's got a basis. Let's actually make it an orthonormal basis just so our life can be good. We're going to use this inner product because everything in our subspace is of the form some polynomial times f. So some polynomial times f, some polynomial times f. Cool. We'll get ourselves a nice orthonormal basis. Let's call it phi j. Cool. Now our green vector, our projection there that Pn star times f, that's in the subspace. So we can write it as an expansion in that basis. We're getting our coefficients from the fact that we're projecting one onto the subspace and then multiplying by the basis vectors. And since they're orthonormal basis vectors, you can not have to worry about any weird constants. You just project it on. Awesome. And you've got this f of z floating around. Let's divide it out. And you get this pn star of z. You get a nice expansion for it in terms of the orthonormal basis. But like, what if you didn't know what the orthonormal basis was? If you don't know the orthogonal polynomials, you could find them by looking at differences of optimal approximants. You just do, so pn um, pn plus 1 minus pn, well, that's going to give you one more orthogonal polynomial than before. And there'll be some constant that you'll have to deal with, but you can always normalize later. The big trick is getting it to be orthogonal. So if you've got your optimal approximants of all of the degrees, then you can find, hypothetically, these orthogonal polynomials without having to do Gram-Schmidt or anything like that. It's great. So why do we care? <laughs> I have shown you how we can compute these optimal approximants. And yeah, I mean, I guess it's nice to be able to find a function that's close. And I've shown you these orthogonal polynomials. And that's nice too, I suppose. Finding a nice basis is good. But let's talk about why, in general, functional analysts care about this. So some functions have this property where f 
inner product is z to the kf, that's going to be zero for all k's not zero. If k is equal to zero, you're just going to get the norm of f, right? But if k is not equal to zero, it turns out to be zero. These are a special kind of function. They're called inner functions. And you actually usually see them defined this way, where their boundary value is one almost everywhere. Um, part of the reason we care about almost everywhere is because the boundary values only exist almost everywhere, but still. So boundary value is one almost everywhere. Now, this is rad. The OA is to one over F, the optimal approximants for one over an inner function, they're all constant. They don't change at all. You can say, all right, give me a bigger matrix and it's always still gonna end up the same way. Inner functions are also really interesting because they're, they can be used to form what are called the shift invariant subspaces. Now, right now I've shown you the subspace generated by F here. I'm taking the closed linear span of Z to the K times F. So this just means take your function, multiply it by all the monomials. You can add them up however you want. So these spaces, when I say shift invariant, I mean shifting coefficients. But what you should think of is if you multiply one of the things in here by Z, it doesn't pop out of your subspace, right? It, and when I say shift invariant subspace here, I mean they're like bona fide subspaces. They're not the whole space. And analysts really care about what's called the invariant subspace problem. And it's solved in this case for H2. Things get more interesting and distressing when you get general. But for H2, you can say, all right, I can tell you what the shift invariant subspaces are. They're these. Now, the opposite of inner functions are outer functions. We're very creative at naming things. Um, these are what we call cyclic. So the opposite of something that's shift invariant is something that if you were to multiply stuff in it by Z and you take this closed linear span, you get the whole space. Like you can't get a nice like contained thing. It just blows up. So cyclic vectors are really interesting too. Same reason. It's the opposite of something being invariant. And looking at how fast our optimal norm decays, this can tell us something about how cyclic a function is. And all H2 functions, these can be factored into an inner part and an outer part. So you can kind of get an idea if you look at how fast this norm is decaying, whether the function is more inner or more outer. Um, if you want some good hard analysis um, estimates, you want to go do some estimates, um, there will be a link to a paper where they do some estimates um, at the end of the talk. So I'm actually, this is the end of the first part. Summary, it's all linear algebra. Like I said, we didn't see a single epsilon this whole time. I set up this whole idea, there was no epsilons. I just did linear algebra, but I did it with functions. And I cared about this other stuff. So um, yeah, I thought this is my favorite math meme. It's all linear algebra. Oh, it always has been. <laughs> well, I have a couple pluggables that I'm going to plug. And then we can talk about some of my more recent work as well. Um, one of the things that I do, it was mentioned at the beginning of my talk, is operator theory talks for early researchers. I organize this with a couple of buddies of mine. And this is meant to be expository level talks. So generally geared towards like second or third year grad students. So people who, you know, they've taken an analysis class, they've probably taken a complex analysis class. Um, they've probably taken some linear algebra, but they're expository talks in that if you wanna learn some more operator theory, it's a great place. And we also do some various um, like professional development stuff. We're actually having mock job interviews in a couple of weeks. So head over to our website if you're interested in that sort of thing. Um, another thing on here, um, Ryan Tully Doyle, a co-author of mine, he has um, translated uh, Nicholas Young's classic introduction to Hilbert Space textbook, which is out of print, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. He has moved that onto an online text. So if you are interested in anything I've talked about, that's where you start. It's super readable. He walks you through a lot of stuff. It's really nice. And then I have my website, I'm gonna plug that. 
Um, I have another talk there, which we'll actually go through part of um, shortly. And we'll talk about what I actually do. But then here are the papers that I just mentioned. Um, the, this first OA paper here, um, this one has those hard estimates in it. It'll start out telling you exactly what I just did. But then it'll also go into really digging into the decay there. So if you want some nice hard analysis, it's there. And then they have a follow-up paper, Optimal Approximates and Orthogonal Polynomials, where they talk more about the orthogonal polynomials that I was going over. So I'll stop here for now for questions on this first chunk, and then we'll start talking about several variables. So we had a question from Kim about, you said almost everywhere, and Andrew said that that's measure everywhere except a measure zero rather than finite, right? Yeah, yeah, except for measure zero. Yeah, um, yeah it has to do with, um, way back when I said um, between some stuff with Fatou and Poisson, where we have um, functions on the disk, you can think about them as functions on the circle. Um, it has to do with taking these radial limits, and radial limits exist almost everywhere on the circle. Um, if you haven't had a measure theory class, don't worry about it. You don't care. All that it matters is, like, there's only some places where bad stuff happens. Mostly <laughs> it's fine. And Andrew also asked, is one both inner and outer, the function one? Yeah. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Um, I was, so this sort of inner and outer, I was connecting them to sort of ring theory. One of them feels like ideal, and the other one feels like the opposite of that. Um, yeah. Except sort of a module version, because you're inside of a, a vector space rather than a, a, a ring. but. Um, is that reasonable? Yes, yes, that's very reasonable. And um, there's like a little bit of subtlety here because in H2 in the Hardy space, I can give you a formula. All outer functions are of this formula. I can give you an integral formula to tell you what they are. Um, inner functions, you've got that nice, it's gotta be one almost everywhere on the boundary. But there are lots of other function spaces that people are interested in. And it doesn't always work exactly the same way, which is even other function spaces on the disk. Um, another classic function space that people are interested in is um, the Bergman space, where instead of doing something that's square integrable on the circle, you care about it being square integrable um, on, over area measure inside the disk. Um, and that'll have a different a different outcome. So that might be an answer to Andrew's first question. Is analytic on the disk necessary? So you're saying like there's some other conditions you could have considered and still got a lot of this to work? Um, yeah, although analytic on the disk for the Hardy space is necessary. Um, I might even have, so one of my favorite books is this bad boy right here, Shapiro's Composition Operators book. Um, I think he actually has an example. I should know this off the top of my head, but I don't. Um, I think he actually has an example of a Hardy space function that's not um, not bounded, but you still do have to have analyticity. Yeah, if you look at log of one over one minus z, that's a function that's unbounded, but still in the Hardy space. So um, yeah, we do require analyticity. You can think also, um, the Hardy space is just the analytic ones, but you can also look at what's called L2, big L2. Um, these are things where it's just Fourier series in general, basically. You allow negative coefficients, but for the Hardy space, we want um, analytic. Um, and so that might be Andrew's other question about Laurent polynomials. I think that's maybe what you just said. Yeah. Um, and then Joel asks, so what is the approximation to one over one minus Z? Are we going to recognize these numbers? Um, maybe. These coefficients? Um, I can tell you what they are in words. I could find it probably somewhere. I didn't type them into my talk, but I can find it because I have the paper. Um, it's in this paper, I think. It's in one of these papers. I don't remember which. Um, but they're the, it's a slight modification of a Cesaro mean. So instead of doing just the straight up um, Taylor polynomials, you kind of average the Taylor polynomials as you go, and that will get you an optimal approximate for that one. Not for all of them, but for that one. 
Um, I mentioned kind of that I think this is a good place for undergraduate research. Um, this is one of the things because I think undergraduates have most, well, undergraduates in the audience can tell me whether I'm full of lies, but I think this is something that's understandable for undergraduates. Maybe with some more reading, but like broadly speaking, you know, it's vectors. So I think it could be interesting to look at other kind of nice functions and see if we can get a good formula for their optimal approximates. It's not always going to be a thorough mean. And then similarly with orthogonal polynomials, um, I'll show you um, some of my recent stuff with these in several variables. And computing some of those is good for undergrads as well. Okay, I think that's most of our questions. If you want to move on to tell us about your current work, that sounds lovely. Yeah. Okay. So, go to our other talk. <laughs> Some of us were not alive in the 70s. <laughs> I wasn't alive in the 70s. But it turns out, so this was actually pretty exciting for me and my co author because we were trying to do all of this in two variables, which we'll talk about some more later. But we ran across these old electrical engineering papers from like the 70s and 80s. And they kept talking about these planar least squares inverses. And we were like, hey, wait a minute. These are just optimal approximants. When the people wrote the original optimal approximants paper that I linked to in the chat, or it's linked to in the chat and in my previous talk, um, they didn't actually know about these engineering papers, but they exist. It's pretty cool. They work on the hardy space of the disk, but the engineers are also interested in the by disk so this would be the disk cross itself so two two variables both of them have to be in a disk a disk of their own and this is kind of a technical thing this is how they were trying to compute their orthogonal polynomials they were or their um, optimal approximants they were saying these are reflections of orthogonal polynomials if you look at the second paper that i link on my previous talk this is how they look at um showing that the orthogonal polynomials are related to the optimal approximates. And this was all about applications to filtering theory. So one of the things they wanted to know is filters are stable when these polynomials have no zeros in the by disk. Now, they had a bunch of conjectures for when this would work, and a lot of them were wrong. They don't actually know. It's still an open question. But let's talk about some of the things that you have to think about when you do this in several variables. And the first is questions of degree here. When we were talking about our optimal approximants before, we were talking about, all right, I want the degree n polynomial. But in several variables, what do I mean by degree? I could have total degree where I'm saying, all right, everything has to be one, or everything has to add up to two. I could talk about multi-degree where I care about the different um, powers in each for each variable, right? It turns out neither of these is really what we want. Now look at the function f is 2 minus z1 minus z2. This is the clear analog of 1 minus z from one variable. And if you say, all right, if I want to think about something like z1, and when I say this h2 d2 of f, uh, sub f, that means in that subspace that I was talking about. So in the plane. So it's secretly z1 times f. It turns out I can't build that by taking differences of things that look like this. So I can't have a basis built out of differences of these things. Remember, our orthogonal basis was going to be built out of differences of optimal approximants, and now we are out of luck. So we have to do something else. Turns out the solution is to choose a monomial ordering and build these bad boys one at a time. So you start out, got to find the right constant. And you find the one that's got the right constant and the right coefficient for z1. Then 1, z1, and z2. You build them up piece by piece. Um, we actually found it enlightening to write our monomials this way for two variables, where you've got 1, z1, z2, z1 squared, z1, z2, z2 squared. And you just read them down the columns and left to right. Um, I'll hopefully show some pictures later about why I think this is useful. Okay, so 
This is exactly what we just said before. I want to deal with the projection onto the space of one, and the space is going to be from the first however many monomials that I want. I'm going to be hand waving the details here because we don't care about them. All right, this met matrix method, same thing as before, right? Here, I am getting myself a Gramian. Here's my vector. The only one that will be non-zero is this first one. And then you just solve the system. Exactly what we just did, but you can only do it if you look at every single monomial separately. All right, now, here's where I computed some for you. And um, this is for one over two minus Z1 minus Z2. Um, I can't remember if I've normalized it or not. And notice I'm building them one at a time, adding one new monomial each time. The numbers are kind of gross, but like, to be honest, not that bad. It's a nice symmetric function. So we get this nice symmetry here. Could be worse. Let's look at an, another example. So here, this is another potential option. So when we talked about one variable, we talked about one minus Z. In two variables, we just talked about two minus Z1 minus Z2, that's an analog. Another obvious analog is one minus Z1 times Z2. But these are not nice. I only am including P0, P4, and P12 because P1 is equal to P0. And P2 is equal to P1, which is equal to P0, and P3, and so on and so on. The ones between these, it's not changing. It's only changing when I'm getting to the point where I'm adding in another power of Z1, Z2. We can't use the optimal approximants to recover the orthogonal polynomials. We're not going to get all of them. If you were to just like Gram Schmidt the polynomials, you will get all of them, but you're not going to get them in terms of these differences. And for some functions, we're not going to be able to get any. Remember how we talked about inner functions in one variable and how all of their um, optimal approximants were um, constant? In several variables, you get the same thing. It's called weakly inner because there are functions that are um, weakly inner, but not classically inner in two variables. In one variable, this doesn't happen. It's the same thing. But in two variables, you can get functions that are weakly inner, i.e. they have this nice orthogonality condition, but they're not classically inner. And you have the same thing. Their optimal approximants are all constant. And here's where I'm just saying, um, if it's inner, it's um, weakly inner, but you can have weakly inner things that aren't inner. Um, like this, this is an example. It looks gross, it's actually not gross. Um, it's fine, really. It's just done with some determinants. So, um, summary there. Things are harder in several variables. You've gotta choose a monomial ordering and there is some open question in terms of which one is best. If you choose a different monomial ordering, can you get the norms to decay faster? That would be cool. And then weakly inner doesn't imply inner, unlike in the one variable case where it does. So some other neat stuff, we actually found a closed form for orthogonal polynomials in one case and actually for another case. Um, we're basically out of time, so I'll only go over that if people really wanna see. But um, there's also, we ran into one of these things where the geometry matters. Um, it matters whether you're talking about the bi-disc, the disc cross itself, or the unit ball in two variables. The ball is better, the by disk is hard. So um, this is kind of a taste of what I've been doing a little bit of. Um, dealing with it in several variables, there's a lot more um, a lot more open questions, I think, and I think it's pretty rad, but a lot of the stuff stays the same. The definitions all work the same way. You just have to be careful with your monomials. So I'll wrap up there, because that way we've got about 10 minutes. Yes, please join me in thanking you, Meredith. And um, we've been being very silly in the chat for this chunk, but um, <laughs> are there any, would anyone like to unmute and ask a question? <laughs> I certainly agree with your 
aesthetic distaste of having to pick an ordering for the monomials. That seems like, ugh, right. what like, do we have? We chose this um, degree lexicographic order just because it's like the purtiest um, and because it gives us some nice stuff later, actually. Um, when you go to find um, orthogonal polynomials later, you can get this nice visual way of seeing which monomials are going to be included. Um, you just get rows for looking at 1 minus z1, z2, which is pretty nifty. And then if you look at the other case here, you get these little squares. Everything inside that square will be included, which is nice. It gives you a little bit of predictability. Um, We'd like to think about this for like the same ideas will hold for more variables, but doing the computations get harder. Um, if I really want to scare everybody, check this bad boy out. This is what I did earlier this summer. It was very obnoxious, but I think I could make an undergrad do it now that I have this case. So, um, cause like it's one of these things that's not conceptually difficult. It's just obnoxious. You just got to grind out the computations, but someone who's had Calc 2 can probably do it. Yeah, you do one day on the um, Yanghui or Pascal triangle, and then you're they're totally ready to do this. <laughs> yeah. You have um, at least one undergrad in the chat who's willing to be a tribute to such a task. So <laughs> excellent. And Joshua asked, uh, free association, does this have anything to do with Grobner bases? So I was curious about that too. Um, I think you could because like I was talking to one of the algebraists at University of Arkansas in the before times about um trying to choose the monomial ordering and which one we might want to choose and they're like oh something something Grobner bases and all I know about Grobner bases is that they were in an algebraic geometry class and I barely made it through that class so I don't know very much about them but I'd like to Hi, uh, this is Ahmed. Um, I have a quick question, if you don't mind. So great talk. Um, but so I haven't ever like really thought about orthogonal polynomials in, in two variables. What's the orthogonality here? Is it still some sort of integral? Or like Yeah, it's still the inner product. Actually, we can go back up. I might have the definition at the beginning of this. Let's find out. Um, yeah, you do still do some sort of integral. One of the things that's interesting here um, well, so if you're dealing with the Hardy space over the disk, you just can do that same um, square sum ability of the coefficients. So um, you just write out your function, your analytic function, as um, its coefficients times the various monomials, and then you can square sum up the coefficients, and that works just fine. You can think about it also as a double integral over the by disk got its um, distinguished boundary, it, the two torus. So you can integrate over the two torus, just do a double integral and think of it that way. I see. All yeah, right. um, there are other options. So if you think about the ball, for example, this is one of the subtleties of differences in geometry there, right? So the distinguished boundary of the two, of the by disk is the two torus, but the boundary, like the nice boundary of the ball is just the ball is one degree smaller, mm. right? So, um, the integration there, you would be doing area measure over the ball one degree smaller. Um, so, okay, maybe one more question that's that. So in, in one variable, you know, orthogonal polynomials have these like recurrence relations, right? Is there such a thing here in two variables? Does that even make sense to say? Indeed. Um, yes, let's see if I can find my horrible thing again. Um, so this was really a, a PDE's talk too. <laughs> well, so if I were, um, yeah, so we can get a recurrence relation from this. I don't know if I put it on here, but yeah, we've got a recurrence relation in this case. Um, it's like, the problem is this is for only one possible weight, right? And if I change the weight even a little bit, this computation becomes incredibly difficult. The thing I would hypothetically have an undergrad do would be um, this exact thing here, put parentheses around the whole thing and put a power on it. 
Um, I've done the just like straight up computations by making a computer do it. And I know it follows a pattern. It's a nice predictable pattern, but actually writing out a closed form like this is really hard. Um, so yeah, if I knew more about PDEs, I think there could be something reasonable to say here, but I'm afraid I don't. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming. Uh, anyone else have a last question? All right, so um, the, one of the last things we like to do is advertise our next talk. Um, so November 12th, we have inverse problems and imaging. So maybe a little like very epsilon -y version uh, companion of this on the other side. Um, is Milena here? I don't think so. Okay, um, so inverse problems and imaging, so that seems like it's gonna, gonna be fun. And I'll leave this up. Uh, so yeah, could everybody please join me in thanking uh, Meredith one more time at the end of our talk. And if you're still watching, you should contact Meredith about offering her a job. <laughs>